I love my smartphone, but I sure wish the battery was easier to charge. Oh well, gotta check my email. Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Bloody Hacks. This is the final episode in my DC Generator series. We're gonna paint up this little dynamo. We're gonna make it look nice. And I know you've been waiting to see me drive this thing with a steam engine, and I've been waiting for that too. So we're gonna do that, and we're gonna do something fun with the electrons that come out of this baby. So let's go. Okay, so I spoiled it in the cold open. I couldn't help myself. It's just so fun that I had to show it to you guys right away. But let's see how I actually got to that point. You remember the generator from the previous video was at this point. It was all built and functional but still needs paint and a proper drive system of some sort. Let's start with the former. After stripping it all down to get it ready for paint, I'm going to be using my usual painting process that you've seen me use lots before. That's the SEP35 Acid Etch Primer from Restoration Shop and Pour 15 Engine Enamel for the paint. I found this combo to be extremely effective. It's super easy to apply and really shockingly durable. I've never successfully scraped or chipped or scratched the paint when I've used this combo. I start by degreasing everything thoroughly with acetone. At this point, the parts are all likely to have cutting oil or other residues on them from the manufacturing processes. This primer will certainly need to mix. It's been sitting on my shelf for a long, long time and the solids are all sitting down at the bottom. Gotta mix it up until everything is a smooth, even gray color and there's no loose solids visible in it. I gotta say the longevity of both of these products is pretty impressive. They've been sitting in open cans on my shelf for several years now, but every time I need them, I open them up, give them a little stir, and they work just as good as new. Hashtag not sponsored, but I keep using them in all of my projects because they just keep working. And also because I still have it and I'm trying to use it up. The paint especially, that Pour 15 enamel, a little bit of that goes a long way. I have hardly even made a dent in that can, and I've painted two steam engines and a die filer, and now a generator and some other stuff as well. That little half liter can is apparently a lifetime supply. These are both automotive products, so they're really intended to be sprayed with an HVLP gun, but I found they both paint just fine with hobby brushes. I will say for the Acid Etch Primer, I use these really, really cheap disposable brushes that my craft store has for 99 cents, because whatever brush you use with this stuff, it will be obliterated. I have not found any kind of solvent or cleaner or thinner that works with this stuff. So the brush will be destroyed. I use cheap garbage brushes for this primer. I've never used this primer on aluminum before, so this is an interesting test. These end bells are, of course, cast aluminum. It seems to be working fine. It goes on a little bit thinner on the aluminum, but that's okay. With acid etch primers, the coating doesn't have to be complete. You actually should still be able to see the base metal through them a little bit. They're intended to go on extremely thin. They're just there to ensure a really good tooth with the base metal. This stuff dries really quickly. 20 or 30 minutes is all it needs before it's ready for top coat. And in fact, you don't want to wait too long because it's intended to cross-link with the paint. And if you wait too long, then the window of opportunity for that cross-linking to occur between the two layers is gone. On to the enamel now. For this, I use my good brushes. These are my nicer artist brushes because regular paint thinner works just fine for cleaning up this Pour 15 engine enamel. You can't see my face in any of these clips. Whether that's a bug or a feature, I leave up to you. However, if you could, you'd know that I'm wearing a respirator. The engine enamel is not too bad. However, that acid etch primer on a scale of fumes of, say, 0 to 10, it's roughly 1,000. That stuff is so bad. You definitely do not want to be breathing it in. So I am, of course, wearing a proper respirator rated for volatile organic compounds, a proper painting respirator, not some piddly little dust mask from the hardware store. And in my experience, your shop will remain uninhabitable for at least 24 hours after using that primer. That stuff is that bad. It is really something terrible. But by the laws of chemistry, the worse something smells, the better it works. That's in the books, in the back somewhere. Look it up. This stuff takes about a week to fully cure, but within 24 hours, you can handle it. So 24 hours later, and we are ready for reassembly, which is, of course, as we say in the automotive biz, the reverse of removal. Up close, you can see once again, this paint did not disappoint. It just leaves a beautiful finish. And personally, I absolutely love this color, this burgundy. This engine enamel does not come in a lot of colors, so hopefully there's one that you like. I happen to love this color, which is good because I have a lifetime supply of it as previously established. 
For now, I'm going to put back on this temporary O-ring pulley that I made to test this thing out in the previous video. I don't know yet what I'm going to be using for the final drive system, but this will get us going. Everything seems to be running smoothly, so I think we're ready to move on. Now, the one thing about generators like this one is they make really crappy power. The voltage is going to vary, there's going to be a lot of noise and ripple and other undesirable effects in it. So for this power to be usable, we need to regulate it. For that, it's over to the electronics corner. Yes, I actually do quite a bit of electronics work, which you would know if you've read my blog. Based on the number of snarky comments I get about the oscilloscope in my intro, it appears that not many people have read my blog. But it's there. Just saying. The star of the show is this little fellow. This is a 7805 voltage regulator. This is a pretty old school device. It's a linear voltage regulator, so it's not super efficient, not compared to modern devices. But the nice thing about it is that it's super easy to use. This is one of those devices that are kind of in a category of devices that the home gamer can use for all sorts of things around the house without necessarily understanding any electronics, or not much to speak of. The secret to using devices like this is to learn how to read data sheets. A quick online search will get you any data sheet for any component that you need. They can be a little bit intimidating at first glance. They're a bit like scientific papers. They're often long. They're extremely technical. However, if you know the basic structure of them and what to look for, you can get what you need out of them pretty quickly. For data sheets, usually everything you need is on the first page, as in this case. In one corner at the top, you've got your input and output voltages, how much current it can handle, that sort of thing. Then below that, you've got your pinouts. You've got to match it up to the package that you have. The same device will come in different packages, so you know which pin is which. And then typically there's going to be a reference circuit or a standard application or a typical application circuit. In this case, right on the first page. If you're new to electronics, you're not going to be doing anything unusual with the device. So the typical application circuit that they give you is going to be the one that you want. And as you can see, in this case, all we need are two capacitors and we're done. This is a very, very easy device to use. And in fact, if you read the fine print, the output capacitor is actually even optional. I'm going to dig through my bins and find those two capacitors. But if you're ordering them, understand that these components are easy to get and probably less than a dollar. This is so cheap, this kind of thing. And a circuit like we're about to build is super, super useful. As an example, for let's say eliminating batteries in a device, here is my exercise machine, my cardio machine that I use here at home. This thing uses four D batteries and it goes through them like crazy. It uses so much juice, this thing. So I swapped it out with a 7806, that's a six volt regulator. And now it plugs into the wall and uses no batteries. I built this circuit 15 years ago and it's run flawlessly inside this machine ever since. So one example of how useful this little device is. The 5 in 7805 means this is a 5 volt regulator. So this thing can take a range of input voltages down to a couple of volts above 5 and it will regulate it down to 5. This cannot create volts from smaller voltages like something like a buck boost converter can. This is a very simple primitive device and it needs a little bit of wiggle room on the regulation so it has to have a couple of volts above 5. I'll mock this up on a breadboard so you can see how it works. My good breadboard has been temporarily in use for, checks notes, four years now, so you're going to have to make do with this ratty old one, but it'll get the job done. I'll stick the regulator in the middle here. The input capacitor goes between ground and the input pin on that regulator, smooths out input voltage a little bit, and then the output capacitor goes from ground to output, smooths out the output a little bit. Then I ground the center pin on the regulator. I'll add a couple of longer wires for the output so we can hook things up to that and see what the regulator is doing. Then of course we need some input. I'm going to send input into the circuit through the rails on the breadboard over on the left. I'll get my benchtop supply hooked up. This will simulate the dynamo producing varying voltages and lower quality voltage, which the regulator needs to sort out. And the meter on the output will tell us what's going on. Oop, almost forgot to connect the input voltage on the regulator to the input rail. There we go. We are now ready to test this thing. My benchtop supply is set to 9 volts. Power that up. And look at that, we've got nine volts on the input and on the output on the meter, we've got eh, five volts, give or take. So the regulator is doing exactly what it should. Now, if I increase the voltage on the bench supply, you can see that the output stays at five volts. All that extra voltage is getting thrown away as heat in the regulator. And in fact, the little tab on the regulator is a heat sink. So you wanna maybe stick your finger on that and check. If that thing is getting hot, then you wanna put a heat sink on that metal tab. But for most applications like we're doing here, you probably don't need it. 
Now, watch what happens when I turn down the voltage. We can go down quite a ways, but the closer we get to 5 volts, the more trouble the regulator is going to have. Usually somewhere around 7 or 8 volts the regulator can no longer keep up, but actually these modern ones, even the linear ones, are pretty good. Here I am all the way down to 6.5, and, and it's still managing to find 5 volts in there to regulate. Yeah, there we go. Somewhere below 6 volts, it starts to fall behind. So it needs those couple of extra volts above the output voltage in order to regulate correctly. This, by the way, is why 9 volt batteries exist. In the old days, in the 80s, everything was 5 volt in electronics, and these 7805 regulators ran everything. So you needed 9 volt batteries because you needed a few volts above 5 volts in order to regulate down to get clean power for 5 volt digital electronics. That's also why 9 volt batteries went away, because regulators got more efficient. Now we have modern switching regulators that don't need that extra voltage, and electronics got more efficient. They're now 3 volt, 3.3, or often even 1.8 volt, so they don't need so much excess voltage. That works, so let's get it mounted up to something a little more permanent. I've got some perf board here, this prototyping board. This is the Jameco stuff that I quite like. You'll see how this works in a second. Breadboards are no good for anything other than a very simple proof of concept on the bench. We're going to be using this in the shop, so it's got to be more permanent. I'm going to mock everything up with the capacitors, and I'm going to put a USB port on this because that's going to give us the more useful power connection to the real world than just those wires would be. Shuffle things around a bit to make sure I've got space, and now we can get going soldering things together. If you've never seen this Jameco style proto board, each pad is a square that's quite close to all the other squares. So the way it works is you solder each of your pins to these squares, and then you can bridge the squares with blobs of solder to create ad hoc traces on the circuit board. So it's kind of halfway between traditional proto board and etching your own circuit boards. It does use quite a bit of excess solder, as you'll see when I start bridging those pads together. It looks very globby and messy, but it's super quick and super easy for very simple circuits like this that you want to be eh, at least moderately permanent. So hold your comments on how messy everything looks. I know that's just how this proto board is. It's going to get very globby, and it does take quite a bit of solder to bridge those pads. But as I said, don't judge this stuff till you tried it. It's very quick and super convenient. With the regulator in place, I can start getting the two capacitors in there, just wiring them up exactly as they were on the breadboard. Of course, making it a little bit more permanent and making things a little bit more compact. If you're new to electronics, you may not have seen that holding fixture that I'm using. That's called a panavice. It's a circuit board vise. It's got a quick release on it for quickly flipping the board over, which as you can see in this type of work is really, really nice. They are not the cheapest things in the world, but if you're going to be doing a lot of circuit board work, I honestly consider it a pretty essential piece of equipment. There's all that blobby solder I was talking about. With the basics hooked up, I'll do a quick check with my continuity, make sure that things that are not shorted are not, and things that should be are. I'll add a couple of long input wires. These will run to the generator. I don't know where the generator is going to be or how far away it is, so I'll just make these extra long. Give myself some options for setting this thing up in the final steam plant arrangement. Finally, I'll get the USB port on there. I don't have the large through holes next to the port that would be normally used for the mechanical securing with those large outside pins. However, I put the port at the edge of the board and I kind of kind of wrap those pins around and secure them underneath for a good mechanical hold. USB ports are actually quite a handy way to distribute 5 volts in a situation like this. The secret to this, this is not a well-known feature of USB, is to short the data pins together. I know that sounds horrible, but that's actually part of the USB standard. If the data pins are shorted to each other, then any USB device plugged into that port will understand that this is a charging only port and it will treat it as a dumb power supply that can supply 500 milliamps. It will not attempt any negotiation or any data exchange on that port. So just short the data pins together, and you've got a universal, fairly low power power source that works with everything all the way up to modern USB-C stuff. Even USB-C is backward compatible in this way. The downside is it's not much of a power source. 500 milliamps on modern smartphone devices is really not very much. So when you plug your phone into this, it's going to read as it's like slow charging mode. It's basically the USB 1.0 charging limit, which is very, very low. But for how easy it is to build, still pretty handy. 
I've got an old USB cord with the end cut off so I can test the connections to the port. Once again, make sure nothing's shorted or anything crazy is happening before I plug in a smartphone or something that I care about. There we go, 7.4 volts on the input, 5 volts on the output, through the USB port. We are ready to go with this circuit. The next challenge is figuring out how fast we need to spin this generator to generate the voltage that we're going to need. I'm putting some reflective tape on the pulley because I'm going to use my infrared tachometer to measure how fast this thing is spinning when I'm spinning it with this drill setup that you saw in the previous video because I knew that this setup produced the maximum 12 volts that this generator is capable of. I actually had to add a paper disc as a background for that reflective tape or else the tachometer wasn't reading correctly. But now if I spin this up to almost maximum voltage, a little bit short of 12 volts, that's running at 5200 RPM, which is actually just about right. The spec says 5300 should be maximum voltage. The good news works as designed. The bad news, getting 5300 RPM out of a steam engine is not that easy. I'm going to be driving it with my PM1 steam engine, this engine running balls out, which is the technical term, mind you, that refers to flyball governors, not what you think it means. Running balls out, this engine is 200 RPM. That means we need to step it up about 26 times. So the flywheel on this thing is six and a half bananas, and the temporary pulley that we made is 425 thou. So some quick math, math, math tells us that we are at about 15 times if we use the flywheel as the drive pulley. Flywheel on this engine is actually not intended to be a drive pulley. It's just a flywheel. It does not have a crown on it and is not intended to drive a belt. However, I think we can cheat and use it as one anyway. What we have working for us is that we don't actually need 5300 RPM. We don't need all 12 volts. If we can get 7 or 8 volts, we're golden. I'm going to give up on the O-rings now because I don't have any large enough. So for a proper drive belt, I went to my local craft store and grabbed a bunch of stuff that might work. There's things I could order online, but I wanted to get something local so that I could try it today. So I got a bunch of stuff. Let's see what works. The first thing I'm going to try is this stuff here. This is what's called craft cording. It's an artificial suede. So it's got the properties that you want in a drive belt. It is a little bit stretchy, but not too stretchy. And it has a grippy surface. Another good candidate is this stuff. This is used for making elastic waistbands in clothing, so you can get it at sewing stores. And it's also got some stretch to it. It's very, very strong, and it's got a grippy surface, especially when stretched to its maximum length. I think one of these might work. I also got some hemp cord there because it's very grippy. But let's try the craft cord first because it actually really looks the part. It actually looks like a scale flat leather belt, so that's pretty cool. To join the ends, I used super glue. We'll see if that works. That works really well for O-rings, so maybe it'll work here as well. The two things we need to figure out are belt tension. Make sure this stuff can drive the load without slipping. And that's why it has to be a little bit stretchy, but not too stretchy. Rubber bands make terrible drive belts, if you were thinking about that, because they are too stretchy. So I'm going to have to increase the tension a little bit. That is slipping. So with this arrangement, I can easily tweak the tension and tweak the alignment just by moving my clamped pieces around on the bench. And with the right tension, it does drive the load really well. However, the belt tracking is not very good. It doesn't like that round groove O-ring pulley that I made for an O-ring, obviously. I went over to the lathe and made a proper crowned flat belt pulley. People think that belts fall down into grooves. That's actually not true. They climb up slopes unless you're talking about an O-ring or a V-belt pulley, which are specifically designed with certain geometry for the pulleys that they ride in. But otherwise, belts climb. So that's why you put a crown in the middle with about a two degree slope on either side, and the belt will automatically naturally ride on the high spot of that crown. During those tests, the super glue already failed, so clearly that's not gonna work. Instead, I got out the sewing kit, and I'm gonna try sewing the ends of this belt together. This was not easy because of how small it is, and I had to be careful not to get any twists in the belt so that the belt would lay flat all the way around. But with a little bit of trial and error, I managed to get four nice looking stitches in that belt. That should be plenty strong, I think. And as I said, that flywheel on the engine is not designed to drive a load really, so there's no crown on that. However, that works in our favor. In a flat belt drive system, you want the crown on one of the two pulleys in each pair and that will set the belt tracking. If we had a crown on both, the crowns will compete for belt tracking and the belt won't stay in place. This is looking really good though, so let's get some compressed air in here and give the engine a run on air and test this thing out. Hey, look at that. 
that's working pretty good. It's at a moderate air pressure. It's about five pounds right there, and we're getting six or seven volts. Not too bad. We'll crank up the air pressure a little bit. At eight PSI now, we're getting uh, somewhere around nine volts. So that's really good. We don't need to go crazy with the RPM. With this simple arrangement, we can get the voltage that we need. Eh, until the belt breaks. Yeah, turns out that cording is not going to work. Even with the sewed stitches, you can see the stitching held, but where the stitching went through the belt, weakened the belt in that area and caused it to snap. So this stuff is just not strong enough, unfortunately. Plan B then, I'm going to try this elastic waistband material next. This stuff is designed to be sewed, so it's extremely strong when I sewed the ends together. And it has a lot more stretch than the cording does, which just means I need to increase the distance between my parts or make the belt shorter. But I think if I take out all of that stretch, then it's going to grip nicely. And it's tracking really well on that crown pulley, so I think this might actually have a shot. Let's give this a whirl next. Ah, uh, yeah, very good indeed. Running at low speed once again, the engine makes six or seven volts, but if we crank up the speed, we can get nine volts out of it. And the engine seems happy, belt seems happy. I ran this for quite a while, no signs of the belt breaking, so I think we are in business. The white color is not great. I could maybe dye it to look more like a leather flat belt, but I think we have a solution for now at least. Okay, but air is for quitters. We want to run this on real steam. So let's get the engine ready. I start with steam cylinder oil which is a compounded oil. If you're interested in what that means and how steam engine lubrication works, I did a whole video on that in the PM1 engine build series. Also, if you have any questions about this engine, watch that video series. They are almost certainly answered in that series. As I always say on my channel, check my playlists. I do curate those. And all the pinions and bearings, of course, were also lubricated. Now let's get the boiler ready. First thing we got to do is get some water in there. This boiler does not have a fill port, so I just take the safety valve off and use that. I 3D printed a custom funnel that threads onto that port to make this easy. I use distilled water in this boiler so that the boiler doesn't fill up with scale and calcium and such like it might if you use tap water in it. Fill that up until we've got a nice reading almost all the way up on the water sight glass. Looking good. Next, I fill the Ron Covell water tank. If you missed this video, friend of the show Ron Covell made this beautiful water tank for me. It's going to form part of the feed water system for this boiler that will also eventually be part of a steam plant someday. And then I will prime the feed water pump so that when the boiler needs water under steam, we are ready to go at a moment's notice. Next is the fuel source. I'm using camping gas, which is a mix of propane and isobutane comes in these standardized low pressure containers, about 5 PSI, and model engineering suppliers will sell you these gas valves that you can thread right onto them. These containers are really nice because they are low pressure, so you can feed them directly into a gas jet without a regulator. That's super handy on these model steam engines. The downside is the energy in this stuff is not that great. It's a lot less than pure propane or something like coal would be, but eh, it's good enough for running engines on your bench. Quick soapy water test to check for leaks. That all looks good. Last but not least, the single most important steam engine tool, and that is the carbon monoxide detector. Keep this nearby at all times. These hobby ceramic burners for steam engines don't tend to burn very clean, and you really, really do not want to mess around with carbon monoxide. You shouldn't really run them indoors. I am running it indoors, but I've got my roll-up door ready to roll up if the CO gets too high in here, and I keep a close eye on it. All right, time to kick the tires and light the fires. Here we go. Burner is lit. About a minute later, the clock is off the pin. We are officially making steam. Pressure is building in this boiler. This boiler is quite the little demon. It makes steam very, very quickly. It does not have a lot of capacity, goes through water really fast, so it needs that feed water system and the burner lets it down a little bit. This is a ceramic burner that I made myself. It's not that great. As you'll see, it has some trouble keeping up with the engine under full load. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And almost immediately, the CO does start to register, showing 39 parts per million now, so time to open the door. It's minus 25 outside. I was hoping not to have to open the door, but safety first, or safety eventually at least. With about 25 pounds on the clock now, we can start doing some other prep work. 
blow off valve on this boiler is at 50, but we can do some stuff in the meantime. I start by opening the valve a little bit and flushing some water out of the steam feed line. There's always going to be some water in there. There's no point in pumping that into the cylinder. And then I can connect the engine. This engine does not have drain cocks on it like a good steam engine should, so it has trouble passing cold water through it. Okay, here we go. Got to run the water through till it gets pure steam. And there she goes. That's a good runner, this engine. This engine's a real champ. Took it off the shelf after two years, fired right up. Runs like a dream every time. And as you can see on the multimeter there, we are making volts. That is looking really good. Okay, let's test it with a load. Plug our cable into the regulator, phone into that. Oh, and it's charging. Look at that. Look at that, like a champ. It's making volts. Those volts are going into my phone. I mean, you knew this was going to work because you saw the cold open, but I'm still excited. And yes, save your comments. I know the crankshaft on this engine has some run out in it. Somewhere between now and when I built this engine, that crankshaft got bent. Not sure exactly when it happened or how, but it is a little bent. Engine still runs great, but one of these days I will take it apart and straighten that. But for now, rest assured I know about it. Unrelated, always a good idea to double check your hose clamps. Of course, it wouldn't be a steam up if I didn't get scalded at least once. Or twice. With those two leaks fixed, the system is running much better now. I was throwing away a bunch of steam in connection leaks on my feed hose. What's really cool about this setup is that you can hear how much current the phone is drawing by the load on the engine. Watch what happens when I unplug the phone. It speeds up. Plug it back in, engine starts loading up again. Unplug, engine speeds up. Plug it back in, engine loads up again. Isn't that cool? I mean, of course that's how it would work. Electrical load translates back into mechanical load on the system, which is why it takes energy to spin the generator and generate the electricity, but it's still really cool. Listen to that, she is working for a living. This is probably close to the maximum load on this engine, for sure. Generator whirling away though, pretty sweet. The generator is a little bit noisier than it was before I painted it, so maybe on the second reassembly something might be slightly misaligned. I need to check into that. The milky white color of that engine exhaust, if you're wondering, is a mix of water and steam oil. It's a good thing, that's what it should look like. That tells you that the displacement lubricator is properly lubricating the cylinder inside there. The displacement lubricator, the thing hanging off the end, is a very clever device. It uses steam pressure to push steam oil into the cylinder at a very specific rate as needed by the cylinder. Steam engines are, of course, total loss lubrication systems. All the oil that goes into them comes out of them at some point. After running for a while, I noticed that on full load and while feeding feed water into the boiler, the burner on this boiler is really not keeping up. It's being let down, as I said, by my homemade burner. The pressure drop caused by pumping cold water into the boiler and the combination with the full load on the engine means that pressure starts to drop on the boiler and I have to shut the engine off, give the boiler a chance to recover and refill the water. A feed water heater would help, which is a system that uses waste heat on the boiler to preheat the water so that the water going in doesn't cost you as much pressure, but really, the burner on this thing is just not powerful enough, so I'm going to need to buy or build something better. But if I stop every 30 minutes or so and let the boiler catch up again, then the whole system is working well. I just couldn't ever quite find that balance of engine load, feed water, and gas pressure to make everything run continuously without intervention. You'll also note I had to add a block of wood to protect the generator from the mist of steam and oil that was getting sprayed on it by the engine exhaust. Note to self in the final steam plant, put the generator on the other side. 
Okay, I've talked at you a lot. I'm going to talk a little bit more in a minute, but for now, let's just watch and listen to this engine for a while. Well, this engine worked very hard, but my phone is charged, and I'm about out of water, so let's shut it down. I always like to give the engine a break, run it unloaded with the remnants of what's in the boiler, and just listen to it idle. Last pound or two in the boiler. Oh, not quite enough pressure left to run. And that's all she wrote. That was an excellent steam up. First one in this new shop, actually. It's been a while since I've done that. That was so much fun. It was great to see all these pieces come together. The generator is done. It's going to make a great addition to my final steam plant that I will someday be building with all of the components that you see here in this last little family shot. I had a lot of fun doing this. I can finally check my email. I hope you enjoyed watching this process. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to my patrons for making all of this possible. And I will see you next time. A Nigerian prince, you say? Tell me more.